It was now. So, Michele, what, what, what do we do when people raise their hand? <laughs> uh, we can uh, um, allow them to talk uh, if it is a case or get them to the chat. Um, let's see, maybe okay. we can just uh, ask now John to talk. Hi, John. Um, oh, John Cornack, nice to see yeah. you, man. Yeah. And you too, Noel. Um, no, no, I don't see you, but uh, it's early morning here, so eventually the light will improve. And hi, Bruno, and, and Bo, hi, and, and Michaela. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Um, my hand was raised in error, actually, so I don't know why. Okay. Sorry. We had an opportunity to try anyway this feature. <laughs> All right. Hi, Noel. Okay, shall we shall we start? Okay. Michele, do I have the go ahead? Okay, that means go uh, good. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I was going to say good. Uh, good afternoon, but uh, I, I guess we have people from all over the place. Uh, this, is, this is a great pleasure for me to be in the driver's seat for uh, this particular webinar. Thank you, uh, Michele, for inviting me to do that. Uh, a very, very snippet of a, of a story of uh, this, this thing. I mean, basically, when I was um, uh, um, um, editor-in-chief of Basic Analysis, I felt that the journal was having a little bit less uh, content in terms of case studies than I wanted it to have. I mean, I remember uh, the tradition of Bayesian analysis publishing uh, the proceedings of the case study meetings that were organized regularly at uh, CMU. And so I decided to invite uh, people to contribute uh, case study papers to the journal as, a, as an invitation from the editor, essentially. And uh, one of those uh, papers, um, one, of, one of the people that I contacted was Noel Cressy. And uh, one of those papers is what we are gonna be um, uh, seeing today. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice success story. I think, uh, you know, uh, extremely high quality paper by uh, some very qualified people. Uh, Noel doesn't need any introduction. I mean, Noel is a very well-known name in the area of uh, um, spatial and spatial temporal statistics. Uh, Bohai is actually um, right now an assistant professor at uh, the School of Statistics and Data Sciences of Nankai University in China. Um, he was a PhD student back in two, in 20, uh, until 2015 at Texas A&M and then uh, he went to be a postdoc with uh, uh, Noel in Australia. And uh, so basically what is going to happen now is that he's going to present uh, this work. And uh, the work is uh, about uh, spatial temporal uh, models for uh, the dynamics of Arctic sea ice. And uh, for the next 45 minutes, he's going to be presenting that and then we will have a, a chance um, to have some some conversation or uh, about about the work. Now, uh, one of the things that I am going to ask you to do is to use the Q and A panel in order to uh, ask questions. And um, what Bohai is going to do is that um, about every ten minutes he is going to be stopping, looking at the Q and A, and seeing if there is anything there, and then trying to if there is some, something, then he will try to answer. Uh, well, anyway, now I shut up and just let Buhai uh, do his thing. So thank you, Buhai, all yours. Okay, all right. So many thanks for Bruno, Bruno for this uh, very nice introduction and also appreciate your time for this webinar. Uh, so today I will talk about the, the basic inference for the spatial temporal changes of Arctic sea ice. And uh, as you know, so this is research is joined with um, Professor Noel Clancy uh, at the University of Wollongong in Australia, and it's based on the paper, our paper uh, forthcoming in Bayesian Analysis. Okay. So I'll uh, first give you uh, an introduction. Uh, so uh, the declining sea ice cover certainly impacts the polar uh, biogeochemical cycles, and also it can cause climate change in other regions uh, because it's part of the energy system of the Earth. And uh, there are already some research on the uh, association of the 
uh, the loss of sea ice, which is uh, some extreme weather in the Europe. Uh, and moreover, uh, there exists the so-called the albedo ice field body effect, uh, which can lead to a further retreat of the planet's ice cover. Uh, so this is because uh, for the ice cover, it has a very high albedo value, which can reflect much of the energy uh, back into space. So it has the cooling effect. Uh, but if the ice uh, is lost, then it can absorb more energy for the sea. The sea will get darker and uh, uh, will lead to further retreat of the ice. And uh, there are already uh, many research on the trend of the Arctic sea ice and the Antarctic sea ice uh, by the geoscientists. Uh, for example, uh, there is analysis of the ranks of the monthly uh, Arctic and Antarctic sea ice cover uh, in the past uh, 40 years. And they found that so in the most recent years, the historically minimum values uh, are observed more and more frequently. So that, that are some indications of loss of the sea ice. Uh, however, uh, uh, this research, uh, they, uh, they mainly focus on one dimension of the data, either the temporal aspect or the spatial aspect. So without considering both simultaneously. So as a statistician, uh, we would like to build spatial temporal models to account for uh, these two aspects uh, simultaneously and also provide some uh, proper measures on the uncertainties of, of the summary uh, statistics. So this is our goal. And uh, this figure show you how the Arctic sea ice changed in the past 20 years. And we focus on the Arctic sea ice extent, uh, basically the sum of the total ice areas uh, in the Ar Arctic regions. And the units is the millions of the square kilometers. And here we focus on the month of the September because in September, uh, typically the minimum sea ice uh, is observed in, in this month. So uh, if we fit uh, this square three lines, we can see uh, clearly a negative slope uh, for the sea ice extent data in September. Uh, but some, there are some oscillations for this kind of data set. So especially uh, we can find in 2007 and uh, 2012, uh, we have the historically minimum uh, Arctic sea ice extent. So this is a, this are a figure uh, just focus on the, the temporal dimension. Uh, so if we look at uh, the year uh, in 1997, we'll have a special map for the for this Arctic sea ice extent data. So the Arctic sea ice extent is defined as the total area of the great cells in the Ar Arctic. And it's based on the original sea ice concentration data, uh, which basically identifies the uh, the proportion for ice for a spatial pixel. So these spatial pixels, they have approximately equal size uh, with the nominal value 25 kilometers times 25 kilometers. Then the instrument can identify the proportion for ice for each, each spatial pixel. And uh, the geoscientists use a cutoff value, say 50%, uh, 50% to identify whether uh, these spatial pixels, they are water or ice. So if, if we sum, out, sum up all the ice pixels, we will obtain the so-called the Arctic sea ice extent. And uh, for this figure, the red colors, they are the ice pixels and the water, pic water color indicates the water pixels and the blue color indicates the water pixels and the white, uh, basically they are the land region without any observations. Uh, particularly uh, for the North Pole, due to the viewing angle, so there is no observation, but uh, Clearly, we can identify these pixels to be the ice pixels. So this is a special map for the Arctic sea ice extent data. Uh, so basically, these data, they are the spatial temporal binary data set. So uh, it, it equals to one if the grid cell is specified to be an ice pixel and zero otherwise. So for such a spatial temporal binary data sets, so the exponential family of distributions plus a spatial generalized linear model uh, can provide a very uh, powerful and useful framework for modeling such data sites. Uh, it was originally proposed by Diego et al. in 1997 and has been applied to modeling very large non gaussian data sites. And depending on how the parameters are influenced, uh, they can further be divided into two, uh, two frameworks or two regions. The first one is called the empirical hierarchic models. 
So basically, uh, we plug in the estimates and uh, do the base inference on latent process. And uh, there are many, uh, some, there are a lot of work on this uh, empirical hierarchy model in the, uh, in the past 10 years. And alternatively, so we can impose prior distributions and uh, fit a fully basing hierarchic model to such data sites. So uh, uh, because for the base hierarchic model, we can naturally have the uncertainties of the model parameters. So uh, there are a lot of work uh, on this, this type, type of models uh, in the recent years. And uh, combining the, the non-Gaussian data with a spatial temporal GRM and the you know, basic framework, basic, basic hierarchical framework uh, are considered in a uh, few literature recently by Holland and Michael in 2016, Brady et al. in 2018, and Hu and Bradley in 2018. Uh, for their models uh, to impose computational, computational efficiency, they will assume a certain structures on the spatial de dependence to reduce the number of parameters. And all, all their inference uh, they, they are based on the deep sampler because they can induce the full, the closed form for conditional distributions of the model parameters. So uh, these are some background on the spatial and the spatial temporal GRMs. Uh, however, uh, we know that, so for this kind of the spatial hierarchic models, uh, they also assume that there exists a latent spatial temporal Gaussian process to, to, to to drive the uh, the non-Gaussian data, so uh, evalu evaluating those models, we will need to involve uh, evaluating the high-dimensional Gaussian random vector, uh, which can be computational computationally uh, very uh, costly. So to reduce the computations, we focus on a low-rank linear mix model uh, proposed by uh, Michael et al. and uh, Cressy and uh, Johannesson uh, in 2006 and 2008 to achieve the dimension reduction for the latent vector. And uh, for, for such models, basically it represents the spatial temporal process by using uh, the basis functions. So if we choose the number of basis functions to be small, so we can gain the computational efficiency. And uh, to, account, uh, to account for the temporal ev evolutions, we will model the evolution of the random effects with a multivariate dynam dynamic model for the basis function coefficients. And uh, this kind of models have been, uh, have, have appeared in many literatures and, uh, and uh, because uh, for the dynamic models, we can model the, uh, the correlations between the T and T plus one uh, explicitly. So uh, they, they can they gain more and more popularities uh, in the recent years. And uh, in, we can find related work in those literatures. Uh, for this research, uh, to summarize, so we focus on a spatial temporal GRM, you know, basic hierarchic model framework uh, with a latent Gaussian process, uh, we denoted by YTS as its core. Uh, and uh, we propose a few uh, physically motivated covariates uh, to model the trend of the latent Gaussian process. So this covariates includes the previous surface temperatures, which can affect the uh, the presence of the sea ice and the, the distance to North Pole, which, is, which mimics the, the, the temperatures. And also we observe some cortical effect. So we also include some other covariates to account for uh, these effects. Uh, then after we fit the model and uh, do the model inference, so we can uh, obtain the posterior predicted distribution for the latent process. So we can uh, propose some useful, useful summaries based on the uh, posterior predicted distri distribution of the latent process. Then we can make some uh, plots and graphs to visualize the, uh, how the CS changes between an earlier decade and a later decade. And equivalently, so uh, we can also obtain the latent probability process denoted by PTS. So uh, it is related to the YTS by using a link function. So here we choose the uh, logic link. So the probability process is the largest function on the YTS. So this is the uh, main, main points for, for this research. 
uh, uh, this figure uh, just visualizing the climate change by using the summaries based on the uh, predicted distribution of the probability process. So uh, because uh, the latitude, they play a role uh, in forming the sea ice. So we consider three latitude bands from 30, uh, 75 degree, 80 degree uh, to 85 degree. Uh, then we can pick up some years to be the representative years to, to see how the distribution of the PT has changed over the years. Uh, here we choose the years uh, 2001 and uh, 2006 uh, in the first decade and 2011 and uh, 2016 in the later decade. So we can observe that for the 75 degree, this latitude band, uh, which is typically located in the ice water boundary region. Uh, so uh, clearly in the later decades, the values of the PTS, they, they shrink below the 0 0.5 line. So 0 0.5 can be seen as a cutoff to see which st status is more likely. So whether the ice or the water is more likely. So it, it can indicate the loss of sea ice. So you can see that so the distribution of the PTS uh, for this latitude band, they, they just uh, decrease uh, from the early, earlier decade to the later decade. So similar behavior happens for the 80 degree north. Uh, in the first, first decade, so all, all, all the distributions, they are above the 0, 0 0.5 line, but in the later decades, so it has a much bigger variations, indication the loss of ice uh, in this latitude band. For a higher latitude band, 85 degree, so because the latitude, latitude is very fine, so they are basically the ice region. So we can uh, use uh, these uh, simple summaries to find the, the climate change in the Arctic, Arctic regions. So this is the, uh, the benefits for fitting the spatial temporal model. So uh, probably I can stop uh, for a minute and uh, I'm not sure whether you have any questions for on the previous slides. Why? Um, can I ask you a question? Uh, uh, can you clarify what's the um, outcome? Uh, um, um, what is the dependent variable that you're looking at, uh, uh, and what in particular? Probably I missed it. <laughs> uh, you mean the uh, oh, the the covariates? The, uh, the really, really covariates for our model. Or? And also the covariates as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, uh, the the response is uh, is the uh, binary spatial temporal uh, CS distant data. And, uh, we assume that there exists a latent uh, Gaussian process to drive the data, and uh, they are linked through a link function through a spatial temporal GLMs. Uh, and uh, I will talk in details on the covariates. So. Uh, Later, but not <laughs> they, they don't appear in the in these slides. So basically, uh, uh, we consider the previous summer and winter uh, sea surface temperatures, which are related to the form, forming of the sea ice. Uh, and also, uh, we also consider the the distance between a spatial location to the North Pole, uh, which basically account for the latitude effects. And also, uh, when we check the data, so. Uh, for a given latitude, so different longitudes, they also play a role in forming the uh, sea ice. So we also take account for the longitudes. And also uh, for some, some pixels, they are far away from North Pole, but they still appear to be an ice pixel around the coastline. So we also account for some smaller, more local effects of the distance to the coast, coastline. So we just add a few uh, basically motivated queries to help to construct the, the trend. Perfect, thank you. Bohai, any reason to use the logic link instead of another one? I think, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, um, probably by using the probability link, we can have some uh, 
closed form for conditional distributions for the for the regression coefficients. Uh, but here uh, we, we just choose the uh, logic link. But other links, uh, they are also possible, like the public link, or more, or, or more flexible link for accounting for the some TO behavior. All right, I, I think you can proceed with the rest of your presentation. Keep going. Oh, okay. Uh, then the next section about the uh, introduction of our model. So I'll briefly introduce our hierarchical spatial temporal model. Uh, so basically it has three layers. The first layer is the data model. Uh, so we use the notation ZTS to denote the binary data and uh, equals to one for S pixels and zero for the water pixels. And the S is the spatial location, T is the uh, time index. So T, T is they are from the, uh, they can take the discrete values from one to, to capital T. S they are the continuous. Uh, index in a special domain D. Uh, then uh, following the Digo et al. in 1998, so we assume that there exists a latent spatial temporal process, YTS, uh, which can driven the, uh, the ZTS. So ZTS given the YTS, given this uh, latent, latent Gaussian process, uh, they are basically the independent Bernoulli random variables uh, with the probability parameter PTS. Uh, PDS is the uh, probability process, and the, the link linked with the uh, the Gaussian process through the uh, logic link. So basically, G of P uh, equals to log log of P over one man, one minus P. Uh, uh, then we uh, need to construct the latent latent spatial temporal Gaussian process. Uh, uh, we further model it through the uh, spatial temporal linear mix expect model. So uh, basically, YTS they have three components. Uh, the first component is the uh, the traditional regression terms modeling the trend or the large scale uh, effects. So XTS is the p-dimensional covariate vector, and the beta t uh, is the regression coefficients. Uh, then the second term is the uh, the the uh, the, the small scale variations term, uh, which is of more interest. Uh, basically, we adopted the, adopt the basics representation. Uh, STS is the uh, basis function vector. It's R dimensional basis, basis function vector. And the eta t is, is uh, coefficients. Uh, they are random. Uh, then the cosine t, uh, they are the uh, fine scale variation component, which account for the further variations. Uh, basically, they are the Gaussian white noise with mean zero, and uh, they are uh, independently and identical distributed Gaussian random variables with mean zero and uh, the variance given by the sigma square cos t. And uh, we further assume that the coefficients eta t and cos t they are independent. So that's the uh, spatial temporal linear mix model. Uh, then the Temporal dependence is introduced through the coefficients of the basis uh, functions. Basically, we impose the temporal correlation through the eta t. So here we use a leg one, the vector autoregression model to account for the temporal dependence. Uh, for the eta t at the in initial time, eta zero, eta one, uh, it follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution with mean zero and the unknown constant current matrix K. Uh, then eta t given all the previous uh, coefficients, uh, they have the Markov property. So they follow follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution, which means given by the ht times eta t minus one, with an innovation matrix ut. Uh, ht is the propagator matrix, matrix, which basically assume how the uh, eta t minus one and the eta t, they are correlated. And UT, they are the innovation matrix accounting for some further variations of the uh, eta t vector. Uh, we treat the K, the HT and the UT, they are all known and to be estimated. Uh, uh, here we shall assume that, so for each time period, so we, we assume that the HT, UT and 
they don't change over time. So they are they don't vary in a certain time period. And also for the prediction purpose, we also assume that the beta t uh, is equals to uh, they don't vary over time. And the sigma square cos t they also uh, uh, they are they are all the equal in a certain time period. So the uh, model parameters are given by the uh, reg regression coefficient beta, uh, the fan skew variation variance sigma square psi, and the the coarse matrix K, the propagator matrix H, and the innovation matrix U. So these are our model parameters. Uh, for the basis functions, we we adopted the the bi square basis functions of multi of multi resolution. Uh, which was uh, used in the previous literature. Uh, basically, for the basis functions, they are compactly supported, uh, which means that they only they, they only take non-zero values uh, in a certain range. So here, the C means the center of the basis functions, and uh, phi i they are the the the, the radiance parameters. So basically, uh, if a location has a distance uh, to the basis functions, say j. If their distance is below phi i, then they take a non-zero value. Otherwise, they are basically zero. And if we choose the uh, basis functions of different resolutions, we can account for the, uh, the dependence of different spatial skews. Yeah, I think uh, I have a single question. You, you had another uh, pause uh, program. Do you want to go until then and then answer oh, yeah, the questions? Yeah, there's. Yeah, probably I can uh, go on presenting and answer those two questions later. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is a cartoon example for the uh, two resolution basis functions. Uh, so, basically, the circles, uh, they are the resolution one basis functions. There are only four of them. And uh, then we can take the resolution basis functions, which are indicated by the uh, by the plus signs. And also, we can identify their relative neighborhood information by using their uh, geo distance. So we will make use of this neighboring information between resolution one and the resolution two basis functions to build up our propagator matrix. And we will use this uh, cartoon example for our simulation study. Uh, then for the uh, propagator matrix H, so if we adopted a multi-resolution design, so we can impose different college parameters uh, for uh, different uh, resolutions. Uh, for example, if we have uh, two resolutions, uh, resolution one has R1 uh, basis functions, and the resolution two has uh, R2 basis functions, we can uh, impose different correlation parameters lambda one and lambda two to model their uh, evolutions. And uh, in the meanwhile, we can account for the, uh, the correlations between the resolution one and the resolution two basis functions. We can impose another correlation parameter lambda three to account for their relationship. Here, uh, here R is a kind of the, actually it's the uh, distance matrix between the resolution one and the resolution two basis function centers. And we use this R to build up their, their relationship. So we can further parameterize the H to reduce the number of parameters. So certainly if we use our model for forecasting, we, we need to check the eigenvalues of H for the possible, for the possible explosive behavior. Then uh, after we specify our model, so certainly we can impose the prior distributions and then make an inference on the model parameters as well as the latent process. Uh, so if we treat the, the latent uh, coefficient vector eta and the fine scale variation uh, vector set O, O means it's on the observed locations, uh, then we can derive the proportional terms of the posterior distributions, uh, which has have the closed form. For example, the first density uh, is the, our data model. Basically, they are the IID. Uh, they are independent Bernoulli random variables, uh, random 
their their density product product of the independent uh, Bernoulli density densities. Then for the second second and the third terms, they are basically our process model, which are Gaussian. Then uh, we can impose the prior distributions and make the posterior inference. And for the uh, propagator matrix uh, parameterized in the previous slides, we have three correlation uh, parameters. So we can impose uh, a uniform distribution uh, on the support negative one, positive one for those uh, correlation parameters. Then for the cross matrix parameters, we use the traditional uh, inverse Richard distribution uh, for the closed form update. And for the regression coefficient and the uh, fan skew variation variance sigma square cosine. So we use a non-inform multiple prior. Then uh, we can integrate out K and U and then sample the latent process as well as beta and uh, uh, sigma square cosine and the lambda from their proportional terms. Uh, for the parameters in the prior distribution for K and U, actually we can uh, first do the inference based on EM based on EM algorithm. So you can plug in the EM estimates to construct the, our prior distributions. And we found that uh, because K and U, they have many entries, many parameters. So we need to, uh, more information. So we impose a larger uh, degrees of freedom to uh, impose more weights on the prior distribution to make a proper inference. Uh, for the fan skew variation variance sigma square cosine, uh, we found that uh, we cannot uh, uh, inference it very well, so we just plug in an EM estimate for this fan skew variation parameter. And uh, by doing some sensitivity test, uh, we, we show that it's not very sensitive to the plug-in values. And the EM estimates, uh, by plugging the EM, EM estimates, we can have some reasonable uh, posterior, posterior inference results. So this is uh, how the prayers are specified. Uh, then I stop stop bit for answering the uh, the questions. Yeah, Bohai, you had a couple of questions. Uh, I think yeah. they have disappeared somewhere. But uh, uh, I think one question was about heterosesticity of uh, the parameters because they change in time. I believe Matt Heaton was asking that question. And then uh, there mm -hmm. was another question about how you justify the use of um, uh, vector AR1 uh, for the evolution of the random effects. Right, I think, uh, yeah, I think Noah has helped me to uh, provide good answers to uh, those two questions. Uh, for the first questions, uh, basically, uh, when we fit in the Arctic CS data, so we split data into uh, different time periods. So for each time period, uh, which uh, of the we have the time span of five years, we assume that they don't change over time. But uh, we could fit it data separately, so uh, these time parameters they, they are different for different time periods. So we can use this method to account for uh, those heterogeneous behaviors for the variance parameters, and uh, uh, to introduce the. Uh, a continuous continuous surface uh, between different time periods. Uh, so basically, basically, we use the results from the previous period as the starting values for the results for for the inference for the initial values for later period to impose some continuity for influencing the latent process. So that's our uh, strategy for the uh, to account for the heterogeneous behaviors of the propagator matrix and the innovation mat matrix. Uh, yes, for the VR models. Uh, so, um, may I ask you just maybe uh, to, um, so since we have uh, uh, yes, some sure. participants uh, on YouTube, um, it's probably best if we actually repeat the questions and uh, um, so that also the people that are going to follow uh, the, um, same, uh, the webinar on YouTube are going to be able to understand what's going on. Thanks, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, the first question is answering. So, uh, because our data has a long time framework, so uh, probably we need some 
heterostochasticity for the uh, for the for the process. So the previous answers are for our strategy for handling uh, this aspect. So the next question is, uh, is to how to justify the VR one model for the random effects, uh, because typically we need to check so the lags for using the VR model. And uh, here I think um, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we use AR1 model to approximate the uh, the PDs for driving the dynamic model, and also uh, empir empirically, so the like one is usually sufficient for modeling the dependency of the latent process. And because our our, uh, our data is is large, so we need to reduce dimensions. So the VR1 model can help us to reduce the, uh, the number of parameters to be inferenced. So that's for the computational purpose. Great. I think you can keep going with the presentation. Why? Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we did a uh, a small simulation study to test the, our, our proposed BHM, the basic hierarchy model, to see whether uh, its inference is reasonable. Uh, so our inference is fully based, except for the small scale variation variance sigma theoretical sign, because we're plugging with a EM estimate. So uh, this simulating setting is very uh, similar to, our, uh, to the case in our previous paper. And we consider the spatial domain, which is a unit square, so 0, 1 times 0, 1 square. And we choose a randomly selected 10,000 uh, lo locations in this unit square. And then we consider the t, uh, t equals 6, consider 6 time points. And then we basically uh, first generate, generate our, our, our data from the spatial temporal GRMs and partition the data into a training data set and a validation data set. And also, we also uh, consider uh, hold out the the data at time t equals to six for the forecasting purpose. Then we check our uh, parameter parameter estimation results, and also we check our uh, prediction results. And uh, our conclusion is that uh, so uh, the basic hierarchy model so typically uh, out outperforms the empirical hierarchy model uh, in terms of the uh, parental estimates as well as the prediction. So that's our conclusion. But I will skip details for this simulation study uh, due to the time limit. Uh, we found that uh, the inference of the regression coefficients is difficult. So if we impose prior distribution on the regression coefficients uh, as the BHM does, so it can give a better uh, parameter estimation results, which can lead to a better prediction results. So this is the uh, main point for this uh, simulation setting. Uh, then we go back to our, uh, our focus, uh, the modeling of the Arctic CIS data uh, in the last two decades. So as I mentioned before, the, the Arctic CIS extend is obtained as the sum of the S pixels, where the CIS concentration is greater than or equal to a cutoff value, say 15%. So the data set is coming from the uh, NOAA and uh, the National Snow and Ice data, data Center, the climate data record. They are available from the 1979 until the most recent year. And uh, for each year, uh, the data, they are stored as a 304 times 448 uh, matrix. They are the latitude times longitude made great, great observations. So in total, there are over 136,000 observations. And for each spatial, spatial pixel, they have a nominal size of 25 kilometers times 25 kilometers. Um, there are some possibility of missing values, especially for uh, some pixels uh, with a smaller latitude. So here, we will focus on the grid pixels uh, with latitude greater than 60 degree north. Uh, this is because in the September, uh, in this month, so basically all the pixels uh, with latitude smaller than this value, they are water pixels. 
so they are not of interest. So we focus on the regions uh, with latitude greater than or equal to 60 degree north, uh, which can reduce the data time to be around 26,000 observations. Uh, then we select data uh, uh, for the month of September over the 20 years from 1997 to 2016. And as I mentioned before, we focus on the region with uh, latitude greater than or equal to 60 degrees north, which consists of uh, 26,000 observations. Then we can further split the 20 years into two decades. Uh, so the first decade is from 1997 to 2006. We can split, split into two, two time periods. And we, we do the same thing for the second decades. So then we can compare the, our proposed functionals uh, for those two decades to see whether there are some significant changes. And in each time period of five years, we assume that the propagator matrix and the innovation matrix, they don't change. But we allow them to be different from one period to the next. And uh, there are some details on how to model the trend of the latent process. Uh, for the regression terms, we consider a few uh, covariates, including the, the summer surface temperatures, the average summer surface temperatures in the last year, and the average winter surface temperatures in the previous years. We can also include their, the spatial temporal covariates, like the previous summer and winter surface temperatures as the covariates. And also when we look at the map, we found that there are some longitude effects. So we also include the longitude as the covariates. In addition, uh, we consider the distance to the polar region, which is denoted as the XPL, means the distance to the polar, not, not pole, uh, as a covariate, which, you, which is also considered in our previous paper. And the last, we also include a local covariate, the distance to the north to the coastline as a covariate, because we can find some S pixels in the coastline, which are far away from North Pole. So there are some effects for the coastline. So this is our uh, proposed covariates. And uh, uh, this figure shows you uh, just a logistic regression fit by using this, these covariates at the year t equals to 1997. So basically, we assume all the data, they are independent. They are spatially independent. So we can use these covariates to obtain a, a trend surface or, or the mean surface. So basically, uh, I think the surface can, uh, can capture some global effects, some global patterns of the ice cover, especially uh, accounting for the effects of the longitude and the distance to the North Pole. And uh, this, this figure shows how we choose the basis functions. Here, we, we chose to use uh, two resolutions. Uh, the first resolution, uh, is, they are indicated by the circles. So they, they, are, con they are about uh, 45 basis functions. Then we can uh, produce the resolution two basis functions. They are indicated by the plus signs. Basically, they are sp spaced, they are placed in the arc arc regions. Some of them are placed on the land regions for accounting for some, some boundary effects. Uh, then we can check the uh, posterior summaries by looking at a certain year. Uh, here I choose the, the posterior summaries at the year t equals to 1997. Uh, the, the upper left panel shows the posterior mean process of the latent gaussian process. And uh, it can be decomposed into three components. Uh, the first component is the trend terms. It's given by the upper right panel, which basically models the large scale dependence. And the lower left panel, they are the small scale variations, which is of the, maybe of the most importance because it's given by the uh, representation of the basis functions. We can account for some small, small scale variations. And for the fine scale variations, which which are dis displayed in the lower right panel, uh, basically they account for some remaining variations in the ice, ice and water boundary regions. So uh, this uh, visualization of these uh, these components. 
uh, then we can propose functionals uh, based on the predicted predictive distribution of the latent process. So clearly the latitude play, play a role in, in forming the ice. So we consider three latitude bands. First one is the 75 degree north, then the 80 degree north and the 85 degree north. I have already uh, displayed one figure uh, for, for the summaries uh, on these latitude bands. Uh, then the band, the, they have a bandwidth of one degree and we can compare the summaries uh, for these bands, latitude bands, uh, between an earlier decade and a, rec a more recent decade. So uh, this figure uh, shows the five number summaries uh, for the posterior distribution of the property process uh, for each of the latitude, latitude band and I introduced before. So uh, as I mentioned before, so if we look at the 75 degree north, which are intermediate value of the latitude, so the probability process have a clearly shrinkage from the earlier decade to the later decade. A similar behavior happened for the latitude band at 80 degree north. And for the 85 degree north, so basically they are the ice regions, they are very high latitude. So basically they don't change much. They are almost, almost the same for the last two decades. And uh, one thing to emphasize that, so when we look at the 80 degree north, look at this, uh, this figure, we show that. So in the, the more recent decade, so the distribution for the PTS, they have much, much larger variations. So, so this may indicate it will have a similar behavior to the latitude band at 75 degree. So maybe in the next 10 years, so the whole distribution will shrink below the 0.5 cutoff line, which are an indication of a huge loss of the sea ice. So this, uh, these are what we can observe from this figure. So another summary is uh, based on the Hoff model diagram, which basically visualizes the, the distribution of the latent process along time t and along a, a spatial index. Here we use the distance to the North Pole as a spatial index. Uh, then we can uh, obtain the posterior mean of the latent process by taking the average of the values uh, with distance uh, in a certain uh, in a certain uh, in a certain band. So we can similarly define the uh, the average average process for the probability process PTS. Then we can obtain the whole model diagrams, uh, which is given by the uh, next figure. So basically, the, the x axis is the distance to the North Pole. So it's from zero to around uh, 70, uh, 3,000 kilometers. For the y axis is the time. It shows the time temporal evolution is from t equals to 1997 to 2016. Uh, if we look at the the PSQ, the pro probability process, so we can see that. So there are two contours. The first contour is a 0 0.9 contour, indicating the uh, higher uh, higher quantiles. But for the 0 0.5 contours, which is the set, uh, which, is, which is the one to the right of the 0 0.9 contour, so it has a shrinkage behavior from 1997 to 2016. So we can use the Hoffer model diagram to show the uh, evolution of the of the sea ice. Uh, so uh, I think that's pretty much for the uh, for our uh, applications. Okay, I think that uh, since uh, as uh, as uh, Bruno was suggesting, we are reaching the forty-five minutes mark. Uh, yeah. So perhaps uh, we can continue right. with the question yeah. at the end. Exactly. And the uh, last one is uh, uh, we can also visualize the so ice to water transition probabilities, which can be seen as a risk for the spatial pixel to change from ice to water. So basically, they are the conditional probabilities for the for pixel, uh, which is ice pixel at time t, but it changes to the water pixel at t plus one. So uh, if we use the 15% cutoff 
values, that means that it's the probability of the joint probability, joint probability that, so PTS is greater, greater than or equal to 0 0.15, but it's less than 0 0.15 at P plus one, then divided by the, the marginal probability that PTS is greater than or equal to 0 0.15. So it's uh, conditional probabilities. We can visualize this uh, conditional probabilities to see which areas uh, is of risk to transit, transit from uh, ice to water. And in the meanwhile, we can uh, check our model by see the ice to water classification rate by using these uh, ice to water transition probabilities. So if the, uh, we can make uh, this uh, classification rule. So if the ice to water classification rate is greater than 0 0.5, we can identify uh, this pixel will transit to, to be water in the next year. Then we can compare our classification result with the, the observed observe result to see whether we can have a good uh, classification rate. Uh, so uh, this is an uh, animation for visualizing the as to water transition probabilities as well as the, our uh, classification rate. So the left panel just to show you the, uh, the special map of these conditional probabilities. Uh, the dark, dark red means it has a very high probability to become, uh, to change from an ice pixel to a water pixel from T to T plus one. And uh, light color means uh, it basically uh, it stay, stay as the as pixel from T to T plus one. So the red panel shows the uh, show the observed areas which have a certain change from T to T plus one. The green color means uh, at time T is a uh, is a water pixel, but it become an as pixel at T plus one. The red means uh, it's a re more risky areas, so it's we have the we have the loss of CIs uh, from T to T plus one. So we can visualize uh, uh, these conditional probabilities, which can give you some information on the the change of CIs from T to T plus one. And uh, regarding the classification rate, so uh, we have a reasonable classification rate for using this uh, ice to water conditional probabilities. We can do the similar thing for the water to ice transition probabilities, but due to the time limit, I will skip this part. So last is the summary part. So to summarize, so uh, we use a hierarchical spatial temporal model, CR, CRM model, to analyze the binary CIs cover over time. And to, and to achieve the dimension reduction, we use a spatial temporal linear mix model, uh, which can uh, reduce the dimension of the latent Gaussian process. Uh, also, it can result in a non-stationary spatial field, which can account for a very, very flexible spatial dependency given a certain time. Uh, then we can compare uh, the summary statistics at a different latitude, latitude bands between an earlier decade and a more recent decade. Uh, particularly, if we look at the, what happened at the 75 degree north, it, can, it may it now showing some similar behaviors at the more northern latitude band at 80 degree north. And uh, these behaviors uh, show that, so over the past two decades, we have a rapid decline of the CIS cover. And also uh, in the more recent decade, uh, we also observe bigger oscillation of the CIS extent. So this, uh, what, we can, what we can observe from the outputs of our uh, fated uh, statistical model. So I think uh, that's all of my presentations. And uh, maybe you can spend some time on answering the questions. Thank you, Buhai, for your presentation. Um, well, I, there used to be a clapping sign in this Zoom thing, but I can't see it. Anyways, um, claps. And, and um, yeah, we have, we have time for some questions. Uh, there is already a question in the board of question of Q&A by Veronica Berrocal. She is asking, how was the 0.15 threshold for the ice to water transition determined? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we can, if we use different thresholds, we can observe different uh, like extents 
for the Arctic sea ice. So this uh, threshold was used quite often for the geoscientist. Um, so we just adopted their conventional way for identifying the ice pixels. So uh, that so that's the uh, that's that's the answer for these questions. If you have a question, you can post it on the Q and A, or you can raise your hand, and uh, uh, I'll I'll let you speak. Well, I have a question, um, yeah. a, a very basic one, actually. Uh, yeah. How how did you calculate distances? I mean, you're pretty close to the to the um, to the pole. You're at the pole. And so the distortion uh, it can be quite a lot if you just use uh, longitude and latitude, I suppose. Uh, here we use the uh, the, the caudal distance, uh, the caudal distance, which is uh, similar to the the greatest great circle distance on the sphere, to account for the uh, the distance between the spatial locations. Uh, another question: How did you determine the number of resolutions that you were going to use? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, so ideal way that we can we can select resolution adaptively. So here uh, we just uh, uh, try the two resolution design, and uh, because if we choose a higher resolution, we have more a large number of basic functions, which can cause some some computational issues. So it's kind of like a trade off between the model fitting and the computational time. So we choose the resolution to design, just a ad hoc way for choosing the re resolution. So it can, it, re it results in a, a few hundred basis functions. And talking about computations, can you say something about it? I mean, how long did this thing take to run? I mean, how did you run it? Uh, some details about that. Uh, so uh, here, because uh, we already, already adopted some uh, dimension reduction ideas through the uh, spatial, uh, spatial temporal linear mix model by choosing a small number of basis functions. So we can, we can still fit the model in a reasonable, reasonable time. I guess if we uh, run, I've got the details. Uh, I think if we run it for uh, like 20,000 iterations to collect, say, uh, 3,000 posterior samples, it will take uh, a few hours, uh, maybe 20 hours, for fitting such a basic model. But uh, it's, there it's, is a... it's not fast, very fast, but it's still uh, doable like that, yeah. But I guess so. If we further simplify the dependent structure for the spatial process to reduce the number of parameters, we can gain more on the computational aspect. Yeah. Uh, there's a question by Lance Waller. Uh, the single year transition animations were fascinating. Were there similar patterns of single year ch changes for the two large single year drops? you showed in the original time sequence of SIE over time? And how well did the model replicate those large drops and recoveries? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Yeah, I think for, this, uh, for, the, for the first figures, it shows the overall change of the Arctic sea ice when we aggregate all the, we sum up all the pixels together. But if we look at the uh, uh, look at the change uh, through the spatial maps, so they will have very different behaviors. But uh, uh, certainly, in some some years with historical minimum uh, sea ice extent, we will see the uh, very large uh, water to uh, ice to water transition probabilities in the in certain regions of the Arctic. We can we can see that we can see the uh, very big area of red areas, which means a large water to ice transition probabilities in certain regions. 
And uh, I think uh, uh, because we, we compare uh, the identified uh, iced water and water to ice pixels are using the iced water or water to ice transition probabilities and compare them with the observed uh, changes of the pixels. And we can compute this uh, classification rate. I think in the most of the years, it has a classification rate uh, higher than 85%. But certainly in certain years, say the years in 2012 or 1997, uh, 2012 or 2007, in those years, which we have huge loss. So for those special years, the, the classification rate can be high. That may be because we need to in introduce further factors, we can drive the huge loss of the CIs in these very special years. But for the other years, so the classification rate, they are reasonable. So that's my, uh, my, that's my answer to this one. Yeah. Noel, do you want to add any comments or thoughts uh, to Bohai's presentation? Oh, I think we need to open the... I'm not talking. The microphone. Oh, there we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Um, well, I, I, I've been answering, Boho is busy speaking, so I've answered some of your questions. And first of all, I've noticed that there are 35 of you giving us an hour, which we really appreciate. Um, and um, so I've I already typed in some answers. Um, I, I would like to add that I think, uh, uh, like Bayesian analysis editors urged us to make the introduction sort of more appealing to what we were doing, you know, it was probably a bit technical earlier uh, in the earlier version. So the introduction of the paper actually puts up a graph which sort of hits you right between the eyes. And that is that we are detecting climate change um, at different latitudes. And we're seeing the collapse of the sea ice happen um, almost before our eyes um, in that those histograms show a lot of variability, but the mean tends to be pretty much the same. And then in the later decades, the mean drops and the variance drops too, because basically there's no ice anymore. So it looks like that climate change is introducing a lot of variability into the, what, what you might call the quality of the ice, not just the area, but the, the high variability that happens and what we're seeing in most recently is we're again seeing high variability. And my personal feeling is we'll see collapse at that particular latitude in the next five years. Um, and, and it's just sort of based on all of this exploratory data analysis that we did, different ways of dicing and slicing the data or the output that we got. Um, and we can do it because of the Bayesian uh, approach. The variability is, is partly posterior variability and also pixel to pixel variability. Um, so I'm, I'm excited, but a little bit worried actually about our air conditioning that's in the North Pole because the collapse seems to be in train right now. Um, the other thing I think we saw was and I haven't seen this in the literature, people are calling it out, that um, while this, the area is decreasing pretty clearly, um, there's a lot of fluctuations from year to year, and sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. But the fluctuations in the last 10 years, five to 10 years, it's very deep. There's a very strong periodic component that is not present in the first 10 years that we were looking at. And again, that, um, that idea of, of sort of collapse or catastrophic collapse is sort of at the back of my mind when I see these strong fluctuations because while you come up, that ice is very thin and is not the same quality as, as old ice. Uh, and when you're looking at the area, which we did, 
um, the presence or absence of ice, uh, we only see um, we only see area. We don't see quality. Uh, but the quality is coming out through these uh, deep fluctuations. So um, sometimes when you work in these climate areas, it's, it's the ending uh, is not a happy ending. <laughs> so I just wanted to finish with that. I think we've found some things that um, the climate ex uh, sorry ice experts haven't um, through the spatiotemporal analysis. Uh, there's a lot a lot of exploratory data analysis. Um, spatial a little bit, temporal a little bit, but we've put it together in a coherent model. <clears throat> All right, well, we are coming to the top of the hour and uh, I think it's time to wrap things up. Uh, I, I want to pass the, um, the, 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 the mic to to Michele to see whether, I mean, he organized this and uh, I don't know if you have anything to add or anything to comment or or any advertisement for Bayesian analysis or ISBA or anything like that that you want to do. Yes, uh, and uh, thank the thank I'm having problem. With the mic, okay, okay. I have a problem with the microphone here. So uh, I just wanted to thank uh, again Buhai and Nohel for uh, their paper um, and the submission to uh, Vision Analysis of his interest in the invited case study. I would like to thank Buhai for um, his presentation and of course Bruno for all the, the work he has done to um, uh, organize uh, uh, this uh, submission as well. Um, I would just like, I'd like to uh, remind everybody that we're going to have another uh, webinar organized by Vision Analysis next week, uh, July 7. That will be the uh, webinar for uh, the um, uh, discussion paper of uh, June 2020. Um, I will send a reminder through SBSS and the ISBA mailing list in the next few days. I also wanted to uh, advertise um, we are not going to have, uh, we should actually be today, we should have been in a, a, a Kunmin for the world meeting and typically uh, um, as part of a world meeting there's also the announcement of a Lindley Prize. Uh, the Lindley Prize of course uh, um, will not be, it's not, not, not going to be announced um, as typically is done for uh, um, the world meeting because the world meeting is, is being postponed to next year. So we're gonna have a, a, um, a deadline for um, participating to the Linder Prize um, set to September 30th, uh, 2020. All uh, um, submissions to um, uh, vision analysis that are uh, uh, going to be presented uh, likely to the ISBA World Meeting 2021 are eligible to participate within the prize. So I would uh, um, uh, encourage you to uh, participate uh, and uh, um, submit to vision analysis uh, with the um, opportunity to um, participate within the prize. Great. So let's bring the webinar to a close. Thank you very much to everybody who participated and attended. Uh, thank you, Noel. It was a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Buhai. Uh, thank you, Michele, of course, for organizing everything. Bye. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you for hosting. Great job. Thanks. Thanks for your time.